Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There is an entire alphabet soup of disorders in our society. A whole, a whole bucket full of disorders. They're just unbelievable how many they are. And uh, this according to physicians and uh, psychiatrists and sociologists. Uh, there is, uh, there is uh, HD. Uh, there's HDAD. There's OCD. There is uh, MPD, which is now called DID. There's PTSD. There's SAD, which is just plain sad. You know. uh, there's SAD. And by the way, SAD has a whole room full of cascading disorders that come off of that one. That just come off of that one. Agoraphobia and all kinds of other stuff comes off of that one. And then there's the one that uh, uh, I made up for this sermon, which is uh, N-O-D. N-O-D. Uh, nod. <laughs> I was trying to find one that was spelled odd, but I just couldn't find one that spelled odd. So nod. So HD, of course, is high, hyperacti uh, 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 hyperactivity disorder. The uh, HD, AD, hyperactivity disorder, attention deficit. OCD is, of course, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Because of, put that back in place. Uh, and uh, <laughs> there's MPD, which they used to call MPD, multiple multiple personality disorder. The hill, the hill. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's not me. It's now called DID, which is uh, disassociative identity disorder. You know, which I guess is more politically correct than the other one. I don't know why they changed it, but. And then there's PTSD, we all know that, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. Or, and then, of course, there's SAD. Most of us don't really know about that. As a matter of fact, most of the people who suffer from SAD don't know it. This is seasonal activity disorder. Seasonal activity disorder. These are people who suffer when it gets to be wintertime or, or when there's too much sunlight. I mean, the, when the seasons come, they go into depressions and all kinds of, it's just funny. The, when the seasons change, it's like they won't lose their leaves, you know, or something. I don't know. But uh, they have this disorder, but it's a really very, and it's one of the least diagnosed of the disorders that are out there. But I'll tell you one that is out there that everybody thinks is okay. You ought to have this disorder. And that's not. Number oneness disorder. Number oneness disorder. We even make big styrofoam fingers so that people can celebrate it. Number one, one number one, this disorder, and so we have all those out there in the world, and and really, I would say the most dangerous is because most people think it's a good thing. Is this number one, this disorder, this nod, and so there is a character in the New Testament. That we, we and by the way, this is a this is a character that has a very short uh, uh, place in Scripture, and it's in one of the least. <coughs> One of the least in the sense of the smallest little what we call books of the Bible or letters of the Bible. It's one of the smallest. And it's 3 John. That is the third letter of John. So you know, in the Bible we have three letters of John. John, the first John, second John, and third John, besides the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation. So this is third John, and there's a guy that we're introduced to there in verses 9 and 10. There's only one little chapter to, to uh, third John. It's probably half a page or three quarters of a page in your Bible. And in verse 9 and 10. This person is identified. And so John is writing to a church, and this is what he says, I wrote to the church. Now, what he's talking about here is he's, he's probably writing to a person, but he means, he means for his letter to go to the whole church. He said, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephus, this is the guy, Diotrephus, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. Meaning, when, when, when John says us, he's talking about the apostles and, and, and the, the evangelists that have gone out from the apostles. He wants nothing to do with us. Okay? So, if I come, he's not sure he's going to, I will call attention to what he's doing, gossiping maliciously about us. Not satisfied with that. So, he's already doing that. He's already making himself number one by denigrating everybody else. So he's not satisfied with that. Not being satisfied, he even refuses to welcome the brothers. So in other words, he's not even going to put himself in a position where he has to be challenged. Okay? So that he's, he's number one and he doesn't need any challenge. He also stops those who want to do so. 
that is actually want to come and be part of the fellowship. He stops them and puts them out of the church. Okay, even if they say we're from John or we're from the apostles or we're from Jerusalem, we're from James or we're, you know, he puts them out. He doesn't want anything to do with them. He has decided he's number one and that, that he's, he should be running things. And, and that's who he is. His name means uh, uh, blessed or chosen of Jupiter. So he's uh, really kind of set himself up there. The name kind of uh, applies. So he doesn't write much about this Diotrephes, but what he does write is not that very good, of course. It appears that this person in this little church, wherever this is, is a man that John fully intends on confronting if he returns to that church at any given time. He's going to confront this person with you know, how this person needs to humble himself for the sake of Christ and the sake of the, sake of the gospel. We're looking at a guy who has tendencies that point to Nod in O.D. He is suffering from that uh, big time in this church. And these can cause problems, obviously, in the Christian church. It can really cause problems in the Christian church. If these privileges go un... Uh, these, these proclivities that uh, one has towards oneness disorder, if it goes undiagnosed or worse, it is unchecked, uh, then it pretty quickly will result in what Paul faced when he wrote his letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. So he went there, lived three years in Corinth, and established a church there that was amongst the elite of... Some elite in, in, in Corinth joined that church, but it was mainly a slave church. It was a church made up mostly of slaves. Sixty percent of the population of Corinth, at the time Paul lived there, were slaves from different parts of the empire. Okay, And so he had a church that... There were great divisions in that church because of... Of, of caste system and, and, and other privileged systems that people thought they had. And there were people who thought they deserved to be number one. Do you know that when they had communion services in Corinth? Do you know how they had communion services in Corinth at the time of St. Paul? When St. Paul had to write them the letter about this? All the first people in society, all those that were the first people in society, they got to eat at a table. And that table was raised up from, from the regular floor and everybody else had to eat on the floor. And then after the dinner, and when they had their worship service, communion was the same. Communion was for the big shots, the number ones, at the table. But the others had to stay on the floor. That's, that's the way it was going. In that. He had to talk about that in 1 Corinthians. You go and read it. You see? So things happen in the church where people decide that uh, either they're... Uh, unaware of the fact of this, or they have somehow been chosen of God. We're going to talk about this characteristic now. The characteristic of, of, of this is something like this. Uh, they love being first in all the circumstances they find themselves in. They love they, they like the attention. They want to be first. This is kind of what Paul uh, Jesus talked about with the Pharisees. They like the first place at banquets. They like the first seat in the synagogues. You go to the synagogues and you see, you go to Israel and you look at the ancient synagogues in Israel, uh, there was a raised chair. There was a raised chair in there where the head Pharisee got to sit on that raised chair. And everybody who came in there kind of bowed to that person as you went into the, into the synagogue. So they like that. This, this desire then will show itself in this person. This person will always have a contrary opinion or they will always be sought to give their opinion, or they will give some other solution to whatever the issue is that's come up. To make sure everyone in the room, of course, acknowledges the nod person, he or she then will sit always closest to the leader. If they're not the, the uh, elected leader, the obvious leader of the room, they'll get as close to the leader as possible. You see this all the time behind the, the seat of the president whenever he signs a bill. Whenever the president signs a bill, you'll always see the most think people who think they're the most important people in the Congress, the most important people. They'll always be standing right behind him. Okay? And so it's the same. In this case, we want to remember what Jesus said. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 14. He gave a teaching in Luke 14. If you are invited to a banquet by some uh, you know, high up, do not take the first place when you're invited. Take the lowest place when you're invited. Because someone greater than you may have been invited. And then you're going to be embarrassed when the host comes in and says, give up your chair for this person. 
take the lowest place. Then, then if the host wants to acknowledge you, he will come to you and say, oh friend, here, come up closer. Come up closer. I one time went to a funeral. You probably heard the story. I don't know. I'm repeating it if you haven't. <laughs> I once went to a funeral of, a, of, a, of, a, of, the, of the father of a very good friend of mine in the African American community. It was at a Baptist church, and uh, so she invited me to come to, to the funeral, and uh, I did, and I was sitting out in, in the congregation like this, towards the back, sitting back there, and when the pastor of that church, when he came out and he saw me, he insisted that I come up and sit in the dais with all the other pastors that would be there. Insisted. Insisted. I said, no, I'm, I'm, no, he insisted. Insisted. We're to take the lowest place. This is what Jesus has always taught. A nod person's actions and their reactions, their behavior, their attitudes always seem to make clear that he or she considers themselves number one. They have number one, number one-ism disorder. And he's obviously filled uh, with pride, considers that his, uh, any other place and humiliation for him. So that's the person. This is who Jesus is addressing. This is what Jesus is addressing with the apostles in our chapter here, Mark chapter 9. Is it possible for Christians to have this kind of attitude? Is it possible that in the church there are people with this kind of attitude? And we say, oh, no, no, the Christians, you know, never have that kind of attitude. After all, you know, wasn't Jesus uh, who said the last uh, shall be first and the first shall be last? So shouldn't we actually be seeking the last place, seeking to be servant of all? Isn't that really what we ought to be doing? You know, uh, uh, we're going to do everything uh, uh, just uh, to be last. We're going we're gonna to fight for being last so that we can become first. Is that what we're talking about here? Not really. That's not really what he said. Let's look what he has to say here in Mark 9, verse 33 and following. We're going to look at the text in a little bit closer later, but I just want to read this part now. So they came to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is kind of like has become the hometown for Jesus. That and... and uh, um, uh, Bethany are really his kind of home bases. Uh, Capernaum was, was uh, Peter's uh, home. So when he was in the house, and we can imagine it was Peter's house, because that was probably the house he probably went to, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? Now, some texts say discussing. Here, this text says arguing on the way. But they kept quiet because... No one, because on the way they had been arguing about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve to him and said, If anyone be first among you, he must become least or last of all and servant of all. Now this is a major theme of the ministry of Jesus. You cannot get away from the fact this is a major theme with Jesus. Because he's working in a society where... Position in society was extremely important. And you wanted to rise in the ranks of that. There were two ways you did that. There were two ways you did that, basically. You either, as a, as a child, adopted yourself out to a higher class family. You got adopted by a higher class family. That was one way. Or the second way that you did that was by your deeds. By some great thing you did. By some great thing you did. Then you were raised up to a certain level of honor and position. And those were the two ways. And there were people in society at that time that were fighting to get to those positions. Fighting, both in the Roman world and in the Jewish world, they were fighting to have those positions. There, was th there were those amongst the Sadducees who, who, who were fighting to get the position of, of, of a high priest. And that used to be by lot. So they would cast lots among the Sadducee priests to see who would be high priest. By the time you have Jesus come along, it was the Romans who were appointing the high priest, which was contrary to the law. But they were appointing him. Why? Because the high priest wanted to make sure they could be as close to Rome and an official of Rome as they could be. It's all about ambition. All about getting up there as high as you can get up there. So the major theme of Jesus' ministry is about this. And he said, salvation is free. And salvation is available to everyone. Remember what the text, uh, the Bible says, many are called. But leadership, leadership comes from the discipline of a servant attitude in the body of Christ. That's where leadership comes from. In fact, 
a major thing with Jesus is, of course, servant leadership. Leadership in the church really comes from being a servant. And the disciples were arguing about themselves, about who's the greatest. Now here, when you see this in context, you immediately see the irony of what Mark is saying here. But anyway, salvation is free, but leadership is a calling. And that leadership is a calling to service. Service. And you know, as well as, as I do, we wring our hands in frustration at politicians who constantly, constantly are vying for power rather than service to their constituency and country. We just wring our hands at it as if they are privileged people to have that power. And that is not the attitude at all. And certainly not uh, amongst those whom God has called and, and called in Christ. So, now, this is an interesting Greek phrase, uh, who, who was the greatest, you know, who was the greatest. really just two words in Greek. It's tis zymon, I mean, I'm sorry, myzon. Tis myzon, tis who, who, myzon great. Who's greatest? Tis myzon. Literally, this is what the, fir, the, the, the one said. The one who is the greatest one. That's really what it means. The one who is the greatest one. Right? That's what they were arguing about. What does it mean here? This word refers to people who, uh, who have, they're the greatest, predicated on their rank. Who would have been the greatest in rank in the Roman Empire? The emperor. See, by rank, it doesn't matter. He could be that horrible, stinking fool, Nero. Or the even worse fool, Caligula. It, it didn't matter who they were. If they had that position, they were the highest one, the number one, right? So it's a matter of rank. These guys are arguing using, according to Mark, he uses a word which refers to predicated by rank. Or as belonging to one's person. This is an eminent, their, their eminent ability, their virtue, authority, power. They're esteemed highly because they personally are important. They personally are important. Okay? So, and they believe that about themselves. Okay? They have this personal importance. Okay? Uh, and then another part of that word can mean, within the Scripture context, worthy of God's permanent blessing. Now, I don't have to ask you, among the thirteen. The twelve apostles and Jesus, who has the right to the title Tis Mizon? Who has the right to that title? Only Jesus. Right? And yet these guys are arguing. That it's interesting in the text, uh, they refuse to tell Jesus what they're arguing about. Very likely the reason why the disciples kept this little debate away from them is they knew that Jesus would know what they were talking about and what they were uh, considering. Okay, maybe half of them were afraid that he'd kick them out of the apostleship. I don't know, and the other half were saying, "Well, yeah, let's you know, he doesn't want us to talk about this because he's going he's going to appoint the one when the time comes." Uh, but Jesus had taught them so much differently. Already in Matthew chapter nineteen, verse twenty-eight and thirty, he had already taught them, Jesus. That at the end times, those who are first are going to be made last, and those who are last are going to be made first. So when the end comes, and all these people who vie for that highest position, and I don't care if it's outside the church or it's inside the church, it doesn't matter. Those who have lived their life to get to that position will be last. Will be last. And he follows that up, of course, with the parable of the workers in, in chapter 20. To, to emphasize what he's saying, he gives a parable in chapter 20 of Matthew about the workers in the vineyard. And you know that story. The, the, the guy needs workers to get the harvest in because he has a great harvest. He doesn't have enough workers already. He goes to the marketplace. He sees a bunch of people standing around. He gets over, goes in the morning. He says, you guys come out of here. I'll pay, you, I'll pay you what's fair, which was a denarius a day. And he goes, he goes until the last hour. And there's one group that just, they just worked an hour. Okay. They had just worked an hour. And they all agreed on a denarius. And then when it came time to pay them, he told the foreman, the parable is about God and Jesus, he told the foreman, look, you pay those who came last first and those who came first last. Because those who came first last thought we're worth more. 
we're better. We're better. You know. Have you ever stopped to think about something? About that parable. Have you ever stopped to think about that parable? The vineyard owner goes out early hours of the day. A bunch of guys standing around don't have work. Right? Don't have work. Calls them. You guys come to work. How come when he goes back at the end of the day, there's a few guys left? How come they weren't there early in the morning? Because they had probably already worked all day and just needed a little extra. Do you ever stop to think about that? The last who were there probably had been working up until the last hour and said, you know, there's still daylight. I can still get some work done today. Do you ever think about that? And then they get paid first. They'd already warned themselves out. You know, Jesus makes it so clear. His, his messages are so packed with the truth about who we really are when we just take time to look at it. And this is what He's addressing the apostles with. It's not how hard you work or what you think that your work is worth in your own eyes. That's not the point here. But that you are and you ought to be least for Christ's sake especially as you work in the kingdom of God. Be least in His sight. Uh, Paul wrote this. Paul wrote about this in Philippians, to the Philippians. Now, Paul was in prison. He was already in prison in Rome and was soon to be executed. And he wrote this in Philippians chapter 2. Christ Jesus, who, though He was equal to God, He was in the form of God. He was equal to God. He had the form of God. Form of God there means He was, he was God did not deem equality with God, that quality of divinity, something to be held on to, but He gave it up. He surrendered it. But He emptied Himself of what? He emptied Himself of that by taking on the form of a servant. Now the word for servant here, given what translation you use, can be slave, by taking the part of a slave. A servant is always someone who stands there ready. How many have ever watched Downton Abbey? If you've ever watched Downton Abbey, what do you have? They're all eating dinner and everybody's having a good time and there's always somebody standing up and behind. That's the servant. Right? So the servant, he took that position. Being born in the likeness of, of men and being found in human form, human humanity, fully humanity, the form there means totally human, he humbled himself becoming obedient to death. To death. That's how far he humbled himself. So if we're wanting to be first, be first. In an, it, as, is that not an undesirable characteristic? Then what kind of attitude should we have? If, if that's an undesirable kind of always trying to be number Now I'm not talking about athletes who are trying to be the best on the game. Okay, I'm not talking about that. That's their job. Sometimes in your job you have to be the best. That's your job. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people whose ambition is to be that. And they'll do anything to be that. That's what we're talking about. And it can be on any context. It can be from, from, from little kids in kindergarten all the way up to people in their 70s who just haven't made enough money yet. They, still got, they, they haven't got all the toys they need before they die. Okay? So it can be anyone. Let's go back to that text. How does he introduce this text, St. Paul, in, in Philippians 2? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. What does it mean by selfish ambition? Selfish ambition means I want to be one for my sake. And then conceit is, you know, I'm really worth it. I ought to be number one. Okay? But in humility, count others more significant than yourself. Count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you Look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Here is the is simple question that I'd just like to ask you. Do you, and think about this, think about your life this way. And, I, and I, this is kind of an honest question that you can uh, ponder on. Do you eagerly seek out ways that you can serve others? Do you, do you do, now listen to the question. Do you eagerly Seek out ways. Now, I know, you know, I've been around long enough, you guys have been around with each other long enough to know that when somebody stands up here and says, we need to paint the narthex, and we're going to do it Thursday, 
And if you've got some time, come on and help us. And people showed up and helped. No problem. They gave of their time. They gave of themselves to do that. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about doing kind things when you're asked. We're all do things that are kind when we're asked. All the time. There was an elderly woman who, had, who was in a Mercedes, in her Mercedes Benz, and she had, it was dark at night, and she had pulled over to the side of the road. The woman was about 80 years old, and she had a flat tire. This guy comes up behind her, rumbling along in an old broken down pickup truck. And he stops behind her. He gets out. He's all scruffy looking and all like that. And he taps on her window. And she's so afraid, you know, she lets her window down a little bit. And he says, ma'am, can I help you? And she said, uh, 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 well, uh, uh, I think I have a flat tire. And he says, okay, okay, pop your trunk, you know. And I mean, she changes her tire, takes care of everything, comes back, says you're all ready to go. Oh, oh, he said, ma'am, ma'am, are, are you upset? Well, I was so afraid. I was so afraid. I, I just went out here all by myself. I, I didn't have anyone to call. And, and then all like that, she said, can I pay you? Like, ma'am, you don't pay, pay, don't pay me anything. I don't want anything. I didn't do this because I wanted to get paid. I didn't do it because you're in a Mercedes. You look like somebody needed some help. That's all I wanted to do. That's all. No, go home. Be safe. That was it. True event. Actually happened. You see what I'm saying? They eagerly look for ways you can be useful. You can be helpful. That's the kind of thing. Most of us are helpful. We want to be helpful. When we're asked, certainly, oh, you need some help? Sure. I'm talking about eagerly looking for it. What, you know, looking in each of our days and circumstances of our days where we can really be of help to somebody. Do we exercise that real eagerness? And, and, and to be Christly in this world to someone, you know. You know, I look at our preschool, and uh, it's not easy. You know, I come here on Wednesday. I only have to come on Wednesday and spend a, spend a little time with them. I try to be as engaging as I can, <laughs> but I try to, to keep their attention, you know. <clears throat> but some of these kids are not easy. I mean, it's tough. You run after them all day long. Or you got to keep them focused, okay? It's not easy. And yet we have people <clears throat> stepping up. Stepping up. Want to do it. Want to do it. That's eagerly looking for the opportunity. Do we seek uh, uh, to lead by example? And our leadership, is that our leadership style? That was Jesus' leadership style. He was a servant leader and he, he, and he actually led by example. And, and so, and by the way, he never sent his disciples out to do anything until he had shown the example of that in his own life. Like healing like preaching the good news, like uh, you know, uh, bringing peace of God to people. He, he, he modeled that himself. I was a junior in college when the, uh, the head of the uh, uh, school where I was going said, uh, we need somebody to lead the uh, students, uh, the students that are working off their tuition. Back in the day, you could do that. You could work off your tuition in, in the school. They didn't pay you. They just would knock off your tuition if you worked. And this was in the 60s. And so um, he said, would you do that? Would you, would you be the leader of the grounds crew of students that do that? And I said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I can do that. And I was about the only one that knew how to fix tractors when they broke and <laughs> to do, do all the stuff with the equipment and all that kind of thing. So I said, okay, okay. And, uh, and so... But I never, I never, I didn't line everybody up and give them a tool and say, go do something. I made sure everybody could do something. And if they couldn't, then I did it. I said, well, you just watch me. I'll do this one today and you, you can you watch me. That's, that's allowing people to know that you're right on board with them. Not only that, it makes you more approachable when they do have an issue or have a problem. Okay? And so, you, you, indulge me one more time for another question. Do we ever reject leaders in the church today? Do we reject leaders in the church? Has there ever been a time when you've had to, uh, uh, when we've had uh, nothing to do with a certain leader in the church, uh, be it because we didn't like him or her, or because personally we had a conflict with them, or we didn't care about their style of ministry, or uh, we we you know harbored uh, some pr uh, previous hurt from them or something? Do we do that? Well, if we do that, if we do that, that's totally understandable. Those are personality issues. By the way, when you become a Christian, your personality issues don't disappear. <laughs> 
They don't disappear. You can maybe work on them more evangelically, but they don't disappear. And people will rub each other the wrong way. This absolutely happens. And the closer people get, the more likely they may be even to do that in, in a church uh, uh, setting. This does happen. This is not outside your experience, I'm sure, uh, that it's not. Maybe the a leader that is maybe rubbing you the wrong way is exercising accountability leadership over you. So you're accountable for something, that person's holding you accountable, right? And, and there's some friction because of that. And perhaps you've witnessed this. I don't know. There's an answer to that in the book of Hebrews. This is what it says in Hebrews chapter 13. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. This is specifically about leaders in the church. And he says, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Does that consider? Consider the outcome of, the, of, their, of their way of life. That is the fruit of their way of life. And imitate their faith. You're not to imitate them. It's not a matter. It's not. See, if there's ever a place where personality is not supposed to get in the way, it ought to be the church. Isn't that what, what uh, Paul says in the fourth verse of Philippians chapter 2? Consider yourself, you know, consider others more important than yourself. Consider other people before you consider yourself. We're to set aside everything, even personality, in a sense, to be of service. What is the outcome of our leadership life then? What is the outcome of our leadership life and our leaders? We don't imitate the leader in his imperfections. We want to imitate the leaders in their faith. We want to imitate them as they imitate Christ. This is what Paul said. Paul had friction with people all the time. You can read it in his letters. But what did he say? Did he say, be imitators of me? He said, be imitators of God as his dear children. And another time he said, when he said, be an imitator of me, be an imitator of me as I'm an imitator of Christ. So what he's saying to them is, I know some of you don't like me, but imitate me as I imitate Christ. At least imitate Christ. And so that's what we're asked to do here. Okay, We're to imitate the leader. Not in their personality, but their faith. Their faith. And come on, we know that nobody is outside uh, uh, of that requirement. And Jesus Christ is our model. He is the one to be imitated. Nobody is more perfect than Him. If there's anybody out there that tis Mizon, it is Jesus. And we're going to look at that uh, so clearly in the text. I remember as an as a, uh, older teenager in our congregation that I grew up in, same pastor. Same, we had the same pastor since I was baptized, confirmed all the way through that same pastor. And he took a, another assignment. And so the... Ecclesiastical authority came to our church and said, "Look, we have this pastor, uh, and he's he's really a good guy. He's really a good pastor. He's a very effective pastor, but he has struggled his entire life with alcohol addiction. He's really struggled with that, and um, he's been in and out of treatment, and he's doing really good now. Would you be willing to take a chance on him uh, to to be your pastor?" And so we did. We, the, the congregation did. I didn't, but the congregation did. And they said, yeah, we will, we'll agree to that. And during those few years that he was able to be pastor of that little church, one or two times maybe he, he, he stumbled. But the, the leaders of that church brought him back. They loved him. He loved him. But I will tell you this. We imitated his faith. We imitated his faith. That's what we did. He was a model for us. And we imitated his faith. And we did not imitate his personality or, or his imperfections, but his faith, his preaching, his teaching. And we loved him. We loved because in faith he taught us how to love. He taught us how to love. And so we were able to love him. You see, this is what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is teaching his disciples the superiority of obedience and submission in a gospel context. This is what he's doing in, in, in Mark 9 here. And, and his closest friends were those 12 apostles were having a serious conversation, perhaps an argument, over who was Tismizon, the greatest one. Can you imagine having traveled with Jesus that long, witnessing his humility and his power? Here's the context, and this will blow you away. Here's the context. This incident happens a short time, very short time, after Jesus Christ had taken Peter, James, and John onto the top of the mountain and was transfigured before them. 
where his divinity showed through. He showed without any equivocation, without any equivocation, he showed that he was the Son of God. He was God. And even when the cloud came over Peter, James, and John, when that cloud came over, he was, sent, he was there talking with Moses uh, and Elijah, the law and the prophets. He completes all the law and the prophets. And as that cloud enveloped him, what did the voice say? This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Listen to him. When that cloud left, it was only Jesus there. Only Jesus. Now, God said to listen to Him. He came down the mountain. What does He find at the mountain? Some, which we read last week in the Gospel, chapter 9. He finds His apostles and His disciples. They can't cast a demon out of this boy. Right? And Jesus said, when is this lack of faith going to end among you people? He says, He called the Father and found out what the problem was. He heals the boy. Casts out this, this uh, mute uh, demon that throws him into convulsions. Okay, she casts him out. The disciples saw this. Why couldn't we do it? Now, he could have said, because you're always making yourself first, so you're always making it about you. He could have said that. But he didn't. He said, this one can only be cast out by prayer. And some texts add fasting. This one can only be cast out by prayer. From there, then, we have the text for today. Okay, And so, he then goes and tells them, how far is my humility among you going to go? How far is it going to go? Let me tell you. The Son of Man is going to be handed over to men and they will kill him. But on the third day, he will rise again. And the little, the Mark puts in this little phrase. They didn't quite understand it and nobody asked him about it. They didn't understand it and nobody asked asked him about it. Why? Because after Peter, James, and John came down from that mountain, who do you think had their chest out like this? Yeah, well, we know who's important now, don't we? We're important. We saw his divinity. We were on the mountaintop. Peter even speaks of that in one of his letters. We were on the holy mountain with him. They were proud of that. And so, when they come down from the mountain, don't you know their brothers came around? What, what went on? What happened? What was going on up there? And they're going, yeah, we got to see him. We got to see his divinity. Did you see that? You didn't see that. We got to see it. And you can imagine how that argument cascaded and devolved all the way till they got to Capernaum inside the house. And Jesus turns and said, what are you, are you people talking about on the way home? Here, you couldn't even cast out a demon. And now you're arguing about something on the way over here? What were you arguing about? And they didn't say anything. Why didn't they say anything? Once you've seen the divinity of Jesus, where is your argument? Once you know who Jesus is, what are you going to argue then? When God stands in front of you and says, well, what did you do? What is your argument going to be? You'll be silent. And then you'll get taught something. It was never about you. Guess what? It was never about you. It was always about the Father and how much He loved you by sending His Son into the world to die for you. It was never about you. It was never about Peter, James, and John. Never about them. It was about who Jesus is. It's about Him being the only Tismaison, the only Great One. And we have to do that. We have to focus on Him constantly. constantly. And how does He show it to them? Do you know that in Jewish society, in Jewish society, this was the breakdown. The Father, the Mother, no, I'm sorry, the Father, the oldest son, the second oldest son, if you had a third one, the third oldest son, then the mother, then the daughters, and then the babies, whether they're male or female. That was a breakdown. The least, the least in the family was the baby. Now there were several reasons for that. One was practical. You didn't know how long they were going to live. How long, what are you going to invest in this child if this child's not... But by the time they made, what, seven, eight, nine years old, then, then you start investing in them. Right? That is still true in third world countries. Still true. The least, that's what he took. 
The word here where it says he took a, a child is really a little child. He took a little child. He took a child. Some child that was there with the disciples, with the people that followed Jesus. Yeah, he's in his hometown, so it could, be, it could have been one of the little nephews of Peter or something. We don't know. But he takes him in. And he sets him in front of them. He says, I want to give you an example of what I'm talking about. And then it says, he embraced him. That's, that's very important. Very important. Teachers didn't embrace children because children had nothing to offer. You know, rabbis didn't embrace children in, in a teaching situation. He embraced him. Important. Because who is God embracing? The least one in the room. He picked the least person in that room, in that house in Capernaum, to teach them who's important to him. And, he embraced, and that embracing means he's, he's brought him to his bosom. That's like the bosom of Abraham. He brought him to his bosom. He said this to them. He said to this. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And what he meant by that, he meant it as an example, as an analogy. He didn't mean a, a child, like we embrace the children in our school. That kind of embracing. He's talking about someone who is that humble. If you embrace that child, you're embracing that kind of humility. And whoever receives me, the most humble one who went to the cross, that's what it says in Philippians 2, me, receives not just me, but the one who sent me. It's about the Father. The first step to humility in the kingdom of God is it ain't about me. It's about Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let that peace of God, therefore, that passes our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.